Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the joint IRIS and DAS RCN webinar on DAS in the cryosphere. I'm Casey Adderholt speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology headquarters in Washington, DC. IRIS is a consortium of universities and an NSF funded science facility operating programs that enable earth scientists to perform advanced research in geophysics, particularly in seismology. This webinar will be recorded and archived on the IRIS um, Earthquake Science webinar YouTube channel. Should you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the Q&A box, not the chat box on your Zoom control panel. At the end, I will read your name and question to the presenters. If similar questions have been asked, I may combine or skip them. And of course, this will be Lucas actually combining and skipping. <laughs> if the webinar happens to crash um, due to Zoom or internet issues, uh, we will reboot, reboot it and uh, just click the webinar link again. Use of distributed acoustic sensing is rapidly expanding in our community, prompting the initiation of a research coordination network to facilitate workshops, tutorials, and other opportunities for sharing ideas and resources. This is the first in a planned series of webinars on different topics within distributed acoustic sensing. I'm going to pass this to the Cryosphere DAS RCN Working Group Lead, Dr. Lucas Zoet now to introduce our speaker today and moderate this webinar. Lucas? Hi, Casey. Uh, like Casey said, I'm Luke Zoet. I'm a assistant professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fabian Balter. Uh, Fabian has been leading ETH's Glacier Seismology Group since 2015, uh, which is hosted at ETH's Laboratory for Hydraulics, Hydrology, and Glaciology, and the Swiss Seismological Service. Uh, Fabian got his undergrad and his master's in the US, uh, his undergrad at Brigham Young, and his master's at Colorado before doing his PhD at ETH Zurich. And since then, he's been uh, at a number of places, largely working on cryoseismology, which you'll hear about today. Fabian's research focuses on seismogenic processes near the Earth's surface, in particular within glaciers and ice sheets. Using seismic technique, techniques, he investigates those parts of glacial bodies which are difficult to access with conventional techniques. His work has provided new insights into glacier sliding, the formation and calving of icebergs, and glacial plumbing, which routes surface water from the, uh, the top of the glacier to underneath it. Uh, other scientific interests of his include monitoring of natural hazards and induced seismicity. Uh, he was the chief editor of an annals of glaciology volume specifically on cryoseismology. Cryo Beginning in March, uh, Fabian will move to the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow, and Landscape Research to continue his work on cryoseismology and natural hazards as a senior scientist. Uh, today, uh, Fabian is going to talk about uh, a current project he's, he's working on that involves the use of DAS on the Rona Gletscher in Switzerland. Uh, some of this work was part of a publication he had last year in Nature Communications, and I think he's going to expand upon some of that work and tell us uh, some new aspects of the study today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Fabian and take it away. Okay, thank you, Casey. Thank you, Luke, for this introduction, for this opportunity um to speak about uh, my research here today um so i decided to start this talk with uh, this image of the western european alps right here taken from 20 kilometers above the earth's surface and um what you see is a seismically very loud environment you see glaciers that are fracturing avalanching melting you see uh, deep valleys uh, where there's a lot of uh, rock fall or other type of erosions you see sites for landslides uh, you see uh, sources of anthropogenic noise in the valleys and so the hope with the new DAS technology is that we're significantly improving our uh, our seismic coverage to better monitor and better understand these processes um, this is a work that I will be presenting now uh, in heavy collaboration with other people in my group, with the, also with the group by, uh, of Andreas Fichtner here at ETH, as well as international collaborators in the US, uh, Eileen Martin and Brad Lepofsky. Okay, so um, before I dive into uh, our analysis, our study, I want to give you a quick overview of why we actually study seismology on glaciers. Um, 
uh, glaciers are, like I already said, a seismically very loud environment, um, perhaps the most dominant uh, source in a moving and melting glacier are, are the crevasses and fracturing processes. If you put a seismometer on a high melt glacier, uh, you most likely will see um, crevassing events, fracturing events uh, once every few seconds. So this is really the microseismic background noise on glaciers. Um, also, if you have lots of melt that flows underneath the glacier, then you're likely going to see a hydraulic tremor noise. Uh, I will not talk so much about this, but uh, this has been an active field of research in the last years. Uh, and also iceberg calving, the production and detachment of icebergs um, is a very prominent seismic source. Um, what I will focus on and what most people are quite excited about are seismic signals related to sliding. Sliding is a very important mechanism for glaciers to move um, and seismology seems to finally provide us with a method to measure uh, sliding from the surface. Uh, naturally you can imagine that other, uh, with different with borehole techniques or other techniques it's very difficult to measure sliding. Um, so people have been thinking about how glaciers slide for quite some time. Um, the original idea was that the glacier manages to flow around bed undulations or it melts itself around bed undulations. And this is sometimes aided by these water pockets at the lee side of these undulations. Uh, and also um, people notice that glaciers are often underlain by these weak till layers. So these unconsolidated sediments that can deform and also participate in basal motion. Now, this is the traditional view, and um, you can imagine that these are rather slow processes. Um, the till will slowly deform or the glacier will slowly melt itself around a bed undulation, but this is not something that happens quickly on the order of, of a few hours or even of a few minutes. Um, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that uh, in the last 10 to 20 years, people have come to notice or to understand that glacier sliding is no, not such a slow process as uh, it was originally believed. This is a um, study that was taken, uh, th that was uh, conducted on the Willens ice stream in Antarctica by the group of Bob Binchadler. And uh, they simply put a, 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 G, um, a GPS antenna on the surface of the ice stream. And the position of this GPS antenna is shown by these gray dots right here. And they let it sit there for a few days. And they noticed that most of the time, the GPS antenna actually did not move. And then all of a sudden, over the course of um, a few minutes, uh, the glacier leapt forward, something like a foot. And then it came to rest again. And once again, it leapt forward. So the time series looked something like this. You had um, a time period where the glacier was not moving much. And then all of a sudden, there was this sudden slip motion. So this, as you can imagine, is not really uh, in accordance with this idea of a slow sliding process, um, something that's aided by, um, by till deformation or by, uh, by the melting of ice of the glacier sole around um, bed undulations. Um, now, later, um, uh, these, these stick slip events, these ice stream stick slip events were looked at a bit more by other studies. And they found that when this glacier slips right here, um, this is actually um, a rupture that expands underneath the ice stream. And as it expands, it gets locked and then ruptures um, uh, in form of magnitude three to four earthquakes. And there are these three phases that are typical for these stick slip events. So at um, a distance of about a thousand kilometer, you can see during each one of these ruptures, these individual earthquake-like rupture phases. The whole slip event of the ice stream, uh, if you integrate the area and the slip and so on, um, is actually equivalent to a magnitude seven earthquake. It's simply much more slow such that it doesn't radiate the destructive seismicity 
that you get from a tectonic magnitude seven event. Now, when you look at these um, ruptures even more, you don't only see these, uh, these, these earthquake type ruptures, but um, if you look at the more details with seismometers on the ice, then you see these, uh, uh, these signals right here. So in black, I'm showing you the velocity of an individual slip event. And in, uh, in red, uh, the seismic record filtered between one and 70 hertz of a station, of a seismometer station that was next to the GPS that provides this uh, slip um, uh, time series right here. And in the background, I'm showing you the um, spectrogram. And so you see that as the ice stream slips, it generates a lot of high frequency seismicity. And <clears throat> what turns out to be the case is that these this, this tremor-like signal, which um, you can see lasts quite a long time, is actually made up of millions of small stick, microseismic stick slip events. And um, the spacing between this microseismic stick slip event changes. Um, the higher, the more events you have per second, the higher these gliding tremor frequencies right here that you see in the background. And then um, when the, um, when the space, so when the events, the stick slip events occur less and less often, actually this tremor, this gliding tremor frequency falls right here. So the reason why I'm going into these details is to show you that um, this example of the Willens ice stream flow shows that um, sliding is actually not a continuous and smooth process, but it takes place in this case. Um, several or two two times a day and i don't want to go into details of the timings this is uh there's cool there are quite a lot of interesting details but just to show you that um this is a a distinct slip of one to two times a day which is made up of a rupture front expanding underneath the ice stream and causing um uh, several regional type of earthquakes and these are again made up of, of millions of small micro seismic stick slip events. So um, this is a whole new way of thinking about um, uh, uh, of a glacier sliding, not the smooth um, till deformation or melting around obstacles, but sudden motion of the ice, sudden sliding. And actually there was just a study that came out I believe a few days or a few weeks ago that showed that before these large scale stick slip events, there's also a pre-slip phase. And this slip phase also migrates underneath the ice stream. So all this taken together means that if we want to understand glacier sliding, we have to take frictional processes similar to tectonic earthquakes and also elasticity into consideration because this is something that happens on such short timescales that this is not only a viscous ice deformation, but also um, there's elastic loading, elastic storage of energy and elastic release. And uh, there are also laboratory and theoretical studies that are supporting this, um, that friction and elasticity is important. And we now uh, need to figure out how widespread is frictional sliding. And this is where DAS comes into place because um, it becomes it comes into play because um, the measurements that we can do with the DAS cable are sensitive to micro seismic frequency, as well as these they should be uh, um, uh, sensitive to the ice deformation associated with these slow slip events. So um, a quick overview of my talk. I gave a kind of a detailed motivation of this work and introduction to cryoseismology. Um, and I will now mostly talk about really how we try to look for um, micro seismic stick slip and slip slow slip events using DAS technology. And if I have some time, I will briefly also touch on what else we can do with DAS in the Alpine environment um, by looking at mass movements event, mass movement events. So I don't think I have to say much about what DAS really is. Um, it's um, uh, basically the measurement with uh, backscattered laser light uh, of 
small strain within a fiber optic cable. This allows us to have very high te temporal sampling of uh, seismic measurements. In our case, we use up to 1000 Hertz and high spatial sampling. So that means that every four meters along a cable, we were able to make uh, a seismic measurement. And an important concept is the gauge length, which in our case was 10 meters. That's um, the distance over which the interrogator, which provides the light source, um, averages the strain measurement to produce a seismic measurement at a given point. So our um, experiment took place uh, in two stages on the Rhone Glacier in Switzerland. Rhone Glacier is about eight to nine kilometers long. It's a medium-sized alpine glacier, well accessible. You see the uh, pass road right here um, in the bottom of the image. Um, it's moderately uh, sloped, so only 10 degrees. You can basically walk from the bottom to the top. Um, without having to do any climbing. And uh, we did two types of measurements in 2019. We put out a triangular shape cable in this part of the glacier. And last year in 2020, in the summer, uh, we attempted to do DAS measurements over the entire length of the glacier. Um, this just uh, gives you a quick impression of uh, how the glacier as a whole looks like. Um, it goes from 2,200 meters at the bottom to 3,600 meters at the head in the accumulation area. And very roughly speaking, it can be divided into two parts. This tongue right here below an ice fall where um, there's a bit more topography, but you can still travel through there uh, safely. Um, and the upper part right here above the ice fall, which is um, the ice fall is about 100 meters uh, of elevation difference. And up here, there's uh, snow uh, much for a much longer time in the year. And uh, the highest part of this upper part is the accumulation area where overall the glacier gains mass. So the snow that falls in the winter never melts completely in the summer. This is um, an overview of the two experiments. Again, the 2019 experiment, which took place right here. We had a one kilometer long cable. It was only supposed to be an exploratory exercise. Uh, we deployed it in the winter for five days and um, we published the results already um, in a paper that came out last year. In 2020, we attempted to cover more or less the entire longitudinal extent of the glacier with a, a cable. Um, this was in the summer, so we both had snow conditions as in the winter, but also uh, snow-free ice surfaces uh, for a month. And um, this is by far not published. We're just starting to do the data mining, and this is actually uh, turning out quite to be quite a challenge. We have uh, 20 terabytes of data, um, thousands of channels, and um, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure we will be busy with this for some time. And this is really what I'm showing you is really just a first shot at trying to understand the data. Um, in 2000, sorry, in 2019, the interrogator was right here in a tent directly on the ice. In 2020, we placed the interrogator. Uh, on the bedrock next to the glacier. And we had this little, or this big tent actually around it. Uh, and it was continuously maintained by people. So how did the installation look like? Um, in winter 2019, we had a two meter snow cover on the glacier. We actually trenched the cable, um, five to 10 centimeter deep trench, recovered with snow afterwards. In 2020, uh, we simply put the cable out on the surface of the glacier. This is here the part that was still snow covered. And sin since it was quite warm at that time of the year and the cable being black, uh, the cable actually melted itself into the snow surface quite quickly. And uh, when we came back after a few days um, to check on the cable in this part of the glacier, we actually had difficulties finding the cable because it had sunk a few centimeters down into the into the snow. So this seems to be um, uh, a really good 
coupling, uh, given that other people have found out that it's important to uh, shield a DOS cable from the elements, especially wind. Um, this is a different part of the glacier in 2020. You see the cable um, right here. Uh, back there are some people for a scale. Uh, and the situation is a bit different here. You can also see the cable started to melt itself into the ice. Um, but then there were some depressions on the glacier because of melt or other things. And um, you can see that the cable in these parts was not coupled. Uh, it was basically suspended in the air. In the most extreme cases, when we had to cross a crevasse, then it was possible that the cable was not touching any ice for a meter or even more. So um, this is something I think you have to accept if you want to lay out a cable uh, over an entire glacier, there are going to be a lot of parts where the cable is not coupled to the ground. Um, the glacier surface in this part is very uh, dynamic. It melts up to 10 centimeters per day. So the uh, melt water streams on the glacier also can move the cable. And even though we try to fix the cable every once in a while, um, we ended up with situations like this where the cable uh, was pulled into these uh, surface streams. So again, uh, this is not an ideal situation, not a good coupling and pro probably also very noisy, just something to keep in mind. Um, also something that was quite the challenge was not only how to lay out the cable, but also how to transport it on the glacier. Uh, we had helicopter support, so we could get um, cable drums where we wanted them to, but then how do you transport the cable as you lay it out? And here you see us carrying around three kilometers of cable. Um, this was one way to do it. And uh, we did three out of the nine kilometers we actually deployed by with three people, two carrying it and one pulling out the cable. Um, but what was also very handy was this, uh, this sled that we bought from uh, a Swiss farmer before the field work. We put a cable reel on top and then um, we were able to pull the sled also through quite crevassed parts of the glacier. And um, this worked quite well. And it was also actually a lot of fun to um, go sledding on the glacier when everything was uh, deployed. Um, but this also implied that we could not really handle more than three kilometers of cable because um, this was already 45 kilograms. Uh, more cable would have been impossible to carry, to lift, uh, to put into places. Um, so we had to do splicing in the field. We had to splice the three cable sections together in the field. So this is some of the data that we brought home. Um, this particular, these particular records are from 2019 uh, in the winter with the snow cover. You see um, in gray, the seismometer signals that we recorded um, together with the DAS records. Um, first of all, all of these signals are very short, much less than one second. And this is a typical surface ice quake right here. Um, you see the, um, the very dominant Rayleigh wave right here between one and 30 Hertz, which is typical. Um, here down there, there there's a, um, an explosion. Uh, which has a rather um, low, frequent, low frequency content um, in the radio wave. Uh, uh, and then... Das habe ich gefunden. Oh, sorry. And then we, um, we also recorded this type of signal, which is really what we were after. Um, a stick-slip ice quake, which does not have the strong radio wave, but rather the dominant P and S arrivals. And you can see both of them uh, recorded at high qualities at the um, seismometer and at the DOS channel. Um, usually these signals have much higher frequency content. They can go up to hundreds or even thousands of Hertz, uh, but the, um, the seismometer was limited to, one, limited to 100 Hertz. And we believe also that the snow cover actually filtered out the high, highest frequencies of this signal. Um, yeah, so this is the cable layout again. 
Um, here I'm showing you the acquisition matrix um, here, uh, 0.4 seconds and the entire one kilometer cable. You can see that the cable was actually equipped with a reflector at the end right here. So um, we actually sampled the cable twice, which is why you have this uh, symmetric um, appearance of the signal. Um, and what's exciting about this is that if you have so many channels, then you start seeing more than just the P and the S wave. Uh, you start seeing, for example, the split up of the S wave, a slower S wave, a faster S wave, or sorry, a faster S wave and a slower S wave. And you start seeing these, uh, these indirect phases that arrive very late. Um, and by using some simple geometry and ray tracing, we're able to um, uh, associate these with refracted and reflected phases. So here's the P wave um, and the slow S, S wave uh, is shown right here, the solid orange line. And the fast one turns out to be the um, refracted S wave into, uh, through the bedrock, which has a faster velocity than the ice. And then this, this uh, um, phase right here in the back, it's not easily seeable by this shot gather, but can be quite easily seen in this representation. This turns out to be the second order reflection. So a stick slip ice quake emitting an S wave, oops, an S wave to the surface, then one reflection of the surface, a second reflection of the bed, and eventually it's recorded at the surface again. So this um, again is encouraging because it shows us details of stick slip events uh, that we hadn't seen before. It could actually even be used, uh, these details could be used to characterize the bedrock, um, the bedrock substrate. And um, also it's quite exciting to even see that stick slip can be recorded uh, throughout the, uh, or with a DAS, uh, DAS device um, so well. So um, now trying to tackle the whole nine kilometers of cables. This is of course much more data, um, but we first took a look mostly at this part right here. This again is the ice fall. Um, this part right here has a bit quieter channels and I will show you more about this in a second most likely because of the snow cover. Um, and also we had a few uh, geophones right here along the cable that we could compare our signals with. Um, this is a full day of one of the cable sections up there in this part of the glacier. So here 24 hours, uh, four cable channels separated by about 30 meters. And down here, just a few seconds zoom into this green part right here. And you see that the high frequencies are continuously modulated right here. So this almost looks as if continuously there is a tremor, which is uh, changing its amplitude uh, on the course over the course of a few minutes. Um, so this is nothing ever uh, I had ever seen at these frequencies before on a, uh, on a glacial record. Uh, and when you look at the details right here, you can see that there's really little sp spatial coherence, even though the modulation of the, of the amplitude seems to go over all of these channels, which I'm showing right here, the phases and the event individual events seem to be completely independent. So one channel uh, doesn't see what the other channel is doing. This is not something that uh, seems to be a typical ice quake source. Uh, I'm zooming into this a bit more, so I'm blowing up the amplitudes in, in the upper four, or this, this time I'm showing five uh, sections. And you see that this is really continuously, uh, this, this, this amplitude modulation is continuously changing, even during these low amplitude uh, times right here. What I'm showing you now down here are two of the geophones. Um, they are co-located with these channels, but they don't see this modulation at all. So there seems to be a signal right here, which only the cable sees. And uh, to me, it's not clear what this is, actually. We've discussed this internally, and uh, I, I, I'm still not sure what we're actually seeing here. Um, but at some other parts, um, we do not only see these kind of signals, which have a low spatial coherence. We do see 
um, the typical ice quake signals which are recorded over many channels. So this is uh, an example of one event right here at uh, about 1230. If we look at the whole acquisition matrix right here, the entire nine kilometers, uh, I think with this setting, it was uh, about 2000 channels. Uh, you can see right here. And the event that I just showed you in here uh, is actually this little blob right here. So a zoom in, um, you can see this right here. Um, and so without really doing anything qu quantitative with this, um, if you see this matrix, you can see that most of the amplitude excursions right here, most of the in individual events on the individual channels have little or no spatial coherence. Um, it's really this one event that sticks out, at least over the course of a few seconds. Um, this is a different day that uh, um, I looked at manually uh, on the DAS channel. And here you see, you, you do see an event or a, a, sus a sustained tremor source, which is um, active um, over uh, a few hundred meters right here and active over a few seconds. And actually, you can also see this on the geophones. So um, this is actually upside down. This is the lowest geophone. This seems to be a source that propagates from down below um, up the glacier. And it's also a tremor-like so source. It's much uh, briefer than what I showed you before, only a few seconds, perhaps tens of seconds. Um, and this now, of course, the question, what are we seeing here? Is this the kind of stick-slip tremor we're after? Uh, unfortunately, there are also a lot of anthropogenic uh, sources. Um, this, I'm not showing this, but this does not have any uh, harmonic lines, so it doesn't seem to be a turbine or a helicopter or anything, but still there could be something that uh, I haven't thought about, like a military jet, for example, uh, uh, who knows. But um, basically what I want to show you with this is that um, if we do want to see stick slip tremor or sliding tremor of a glacier, uh, if that's what we're after, then we see different kinds of candidates. Uh, one is a spatially uncorrelated tremor, uh, which cannot be seen in the geophone. So it's not clear what this is. Uh, it could be something related exclusively to DAS, but there are also other propagating um, tremor sources, um, which by the way, have also been seen uh, in other places like, uh, like Greenland in a recent study, um, which could be this, this image in the background here. Um, so to look at the amplitude differences in a little bit more detail and, um, and systematically, uh, I looked at the, the um, PPSDs right here, the, the noise spectra um, shown probabilistically uh, in this image over one day. Um, this, the warm colors right here show you, um, or, or this is a gather of all of the um, continuous um, uh, spect uh, all of the spectra of the continuous uh, record. And the warmer the colors, the more likely you are to hit a given frequency uh, and uh, PSD bin. So uh, you see that there, right here, there's a, a band right here um, or a strength of, of the continuous noise, noise, which is very prominent in this day. Um, and so what I did is, um, I calculated the mean for each one of the channels, or at least for a subset of the channels along the cable. And I plotted the, the means with the same color code as you see right here. And you can see that um, there's a tendency for the upper channels right here to have the lowest noise and the lower channels to have the elevated noise. And as you would expect, this corresponds well with the snow line right here. You see the snow line on this day or on a few days before, I believe, was just above the ice fall. And um, uh, all of these channels that are relatively no, no, low noise were buried in the snow. Um, I did the same thing then, not looking at the mean of the noise uh, spectra, but at the standard deviation. So this is where this shows you how, how much at a given frequency um, the 
noise changes throughout this day. And here you see that um, the upper channels are actually not too much varying. Uh, in contrast, the lower channels right here, which are in the snow-free uh, glacier, they have this prominent peak um, around or just below one hertz. So something changes throughout the day, uh, which promotes um, uh, at some, uh, which promotes a large variance at these frequencies. This could be related to English water flow, which uh, people have shown um, has a dominant noise or a dominant uh, tremor frequency below uh, 10 Hertz. Uh, who knows, it could also be related to something else. Uh, what we're interested in, of course, the stick slip kind of tremor that um, uh, that other people have seen in Antarctica and Greenland, it's not so clear. Here, uh, you don't see this clear separation between upper part of the glacier and lower part of the glacier. Um, so this shows you kind of how the um, high frequencies of the dust measurements behave. Um, then there's also the possibility to use DAS as um, sort of a GPS device um, to really look at the, um, at the deformation at lower frequencies, far below one hertz. Um, so this is uh, what a, um, a, a scientific, a, a researcher at Andreas Fichtner's group, Pascal Edme, is working on right now. And he's produced many very interesting pictures and movies. And uh, I just want to show you one right here. This is uh, 20 minutes of low frequency signals, I believe filtered below 0.1 Hertz over the entire glacier, over the entire uh, cable. And you can see a very rich pattern in amplitude variations. Um, we believe that most of this part in the background right here is related to wind. And you can also see this contrasting picture between the lower ice, uh, lower snow-free ice and the upper um, uh, snow-covered part of the glacier. But then we also started seeing these, uh, these other distinct uh, and very very prominent phases. Uh, they tend to show up in the mornings and in the afternoons. And um, unfortunately, this turns out to be uh, shadowing effects. So um, we have the wind right here, and then these linear features, uh, which are shadow effects. And this is something that we already saw in the, in the field, um, that when the sun sets behind the mountain range and the, the mountain shadow moves slowly across the cable, then this uh, um, is a very, or this generates a very clear signal in the DOS and it migrates at a few kilometers per hour. So um, it doesn't seem to be anything related to ice deformation, unfortunately, but uh, more to, to a thermal effect that's induced by the shadowing, the shadow migration. And there may also be other shadowing sources for example, by cloud movement. Uh, I'm not showing this right here, but this uh, seems to be a very, very prominent signal. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is just to tell you, uh, if we do want to see a slow slip event on a glacier, um, it will be quite challenging because there's so much modulation due to wind or other atmospheric uh, signals and the shattering effect. Okay, I have a, I do have a few minutes, so um, I want to um, show some work that we also did on on mass movements, on alpine mass movements. And the first one actually came out of the winter Rhone experiment. Uh, when we on a on a warm day, we started hearing a lot of rock falls, mostly from this side of the moraine of the glacier moraine, but also we saw we heard and saw other rock falls over here. And um, this was a very warm day. Um, the moraine and other uh, snow cover on, or, or snow cover on the on the lateral slopes was melting, so the the rocks were getting loose. And so then we decided to sit down for a few hours and record every single event that we heard. Um, and there was a slightly bigger event, which was probably a few cubic meters 
uh, large. Um, I witnessed it. Uh, I wrote it down, and then went and then I went into the DAS data, and I saw that both the DAS and the seismic data had clearly recorded this this nice rockfall signal with these individual bursts right here corresponding to the impacts of the rock on the ground. Um, this is again the signal right here, 100 seconds. You can see the rockfall signal right here, buried within again all of these high frequency bursts that we that you see everywhere. Uh, most of them are not correlated with other channels or only correlated over very short distances, um, essentially corresponding to the to the gauge length. Um, but when we do beamforming, um, which uh, exploits the coherence of the signal throughout the entire um, DAS uh, cable in order to, to get a back azimuth of the signal, so essentially turning the DAS uh, into a seismic antenna, um, then we actually uh, were able to calculate where the rockfall signal was coming from. And you see right here that an azimuth of about 220, 230 uh, degrees, which corresponds uh, exactly to where we had seen it on the um, on the moraine. Uh, and we can also get a speed uh, of the seismic waves as they travel from the rock fault through the um, through the cable. Uh, it's about the the speed of uh, the radio wave uh, in ice. And this right here shows you the more or less the the coherence of the signal. So before the rockfall signal here and here, we don't see much. But then when the rockfall signal arrives, we see this coherence jump up. And um, this could be something that perhaps could be used in the future for monitoring or even warning uh, for rockfalls. Um, another experiment. Um, that we're conducting right now completely independent of the Rhone Glacier experiment is um, a, an avalanche experiment. This is the test site of the Swiss avalanche, Snow and Avalanche Research Center. Um, they have this bunker right here equipped with lots of, uh, with lots of measurements, lots of sensors uh, with uh, um, with automatic cameras, radar, many other things. And then within the slope right here, the avalanche slope, um, there are a few caverns and um, other measurement devices that actually measure the avalanche directly in the flow path. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm showing you the lowest cavern right here because it is connected to the bunker with a fiber optic cable, which provides the communication for these measurements right here to the bunker and then eventually um, to the lab. Um, and so what we did is we simply, so we simply connected an interrogator uh, in this bunker right here. And uh, we were lucky this winter because Switzerland had lots of snow avalanches, including <clears throat> this one right here, which seems to have been the biggest one in the last 20 years. So. It's a bit hard to see, but you see the avalanche masses moving down right here, and they're moving directly over the cable. And as expected, you see a very clear uh, signal in the DAS records. Um, so down here, I'm showing you the distance along this communication cable, um, and here, time and seconds. And you see that the first arrivals right here, the front is clearly moving uh, with an avalanche uh, typical speed along the cable. Um, but then we see lots of other things. Uh, we see different type of surges, these fronts that then uh, come behind the main, sur main surge. And then also all of these other individual signals, which could be related to roll wave, uh, which arise from instabilities and in granular flows. Uh, a lot of details. Uh, we haven't really um, analyzed this uh, um, systematically, but just to show you that um, there's probably a lot of potential in also using DAS cables for avalanche research or in a larger sense for monitoring mass movements. And uh, with this, I'm coming to my last slide. Um, in conclusion, in glacier seismology and cryoseismology, we want to monitor seismicity over an entire 
glacier or at least larger spatial scales than we can usually do with uh, conventional seismometers. And it seems that DAS provides a solution, but certainly the large amount of data is a challenge that we still have to tackle. Um, first experience show us some very nice uh, high quality results, a lot of details of this of the ice quakes of the stick slip events that we hadn't seen before, and probably for mass movements, uh, we can also get uh, we can also use DAS uh, very nicely. Um, there are some other papers that have since been uh, either submitted or published. So if you're interested in this topic further, I can uh, recommend these uh, manuscripts, which are all available online. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Fabian. That was great. Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat, and I'll try to clump some of them together. <laughs> some of them together. Uh, one is kind of summed up by uh, Tim Barthamus here, and he says, that was really fascinating, Fabian. How confident are you that the high-frequency amplitude modulated signals in the DAS have a glacial origin? It's odd that you don't see the signal in the geophones. Have you compared the time series of meteorological data with noise amplitude? So there's a lot of questions when we talk about those signals that showed up in the DAS, but not in the geophones. Yeah. Um, no, uh, so the, qu the quick answer is no, we haven't done this systematically. Um, we, we do have uh, some media data now uh, from a nearby valley, uh, which I hope will also shed enough light on, uh, on this. Uh, the thing is that there's so much modulation even during the night um, where, I mean, the, the temperature is not changing much. There's not much melt. Um, if it was wind that's responsible for this, it's a bit surprising that the wind generates a signal nearly at the Nyquist frequency, which was 500 hertz. So right now I, I, I cannot provide an answer what this is, but it, we definitely have to answer this for sure. Yeah. Great. Uh, Seth Olinger asks, if there are any GPS receivers deployed on Roan that could help uh, detect stick slip or validate candidate stick slip signals? Uh, yes, there, there are a few um, GPS receivers. Um, if Roan is flowing much more slowly than the Willens ice stream. Um, usually it's very hard to dissolve any or to resolve any um, motion events. Uh, you can see a diurnal signal uh, perhaps, but <clears throat> other than that, we're really getting very close to the resolution of GPS signals. So um, although we definitely plan to compare the GPS signals to the DOS data, I think we really have to find the clearest and the most, like the strongest mini surge, if you will, by perhaps uh, induced by a rainfall um, to, to, uh, to find something similar in the DAS data. This is a really slowly moving glacier compared to Willens Ice Stream. Uh, Dale Weinbrenner asked a question uh, and it kind of deals with something on the slide right now. Uh, he says, thanks for the exceptionally lucid and informative talk. Your experiments thus far apparently have all used cable placement on the glacier surface. Could you comment on the prospect uh, utility of DAS ob observations on a cable placed vertically within a borehole within the glacier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for this, probably the best thing would be to read this paper right here by Adam Booth and Alex Brisburn, one in Greenland, one in Antarctica, where they did this for um, active uh, active applications. And I'm not a specialist on this, but it seems to work quite well actually with active um, stuff. Um, for monitoring passively se um, seismic signals, um, I, I would assume that this um, identification of individual uh, phases that we saw before, like refracted phases, multiply reflected phases will even improve if we also have a vertical resolution. Um, so this is certainly something that, that could be tried, yes. That, that kind of leads into a series of other questions, which is what type of cable did you use? Was it helically wound? If not, how did you deal with the directional sensitivity of the cable? Oh, good question. Uh, I, I don't think I can answer this. Uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps someone else in the audience <laughs> who was part of... Um, well, I'll look for it coming in, but... 
some other people asked if you could clarify the shadowing effect you talked about like what exactly is uh the shadowing effect and how is that producing that sort of stripe that you showed in the, in the long yes um so honestly what exactly it is um we've also speculated about but it seems to be this um just one part of the cable or one channel is in the in the shade so it's not receiving any light uh, and probably it has to do with um, thermal expansion or something or thermal ex uh, contraction and the other part of the cable is still receiving the light and this um, uh, when we're in the field actually we could see uh, in the real-time data that this this uh, this effect moved across the data uh, across the cable and when we looked outside we saw the shade more or less where we expected it based on based on the on the data that we looked at. Yeah. There's some uh, sort of deployment related questions. One is how did you power the interrogator for the whole time that you were out there? Uh, we had um, small uh, hand carryable uh, generators, um, but they they're the kind of type that are not super reliable. So someone had to be there the whole time. Um, uh, there was a temporary uh, power bridge in case there was a failure, a, a generator failure, but this meant still meant that within a few minutes you had to react. So there was always someone there and an alarm, even in the tent that you were sleeping. Great. Uh, Julian Pelaez asks, hi, I'm curious if there's any chance the ice freezing around the cable or the glacier movement uh, cause any cable damages or tensions that corrupt the data. Also, do you think that localized slip cracking events inside the ice could also be beam formed with this layout as you did with the rock ball? Yeah. Um, so the first question, uh, we were surprised how, how um, strong the cable was. We didn't see any damage during this one month. And the cable was like the glacier did not treat the cable well. I can guarantee you. Like uh, there were um, uh, snow bridge collapses where the snow bridges pulled the cable into the into the crevasse tens of meters down, and we had to. It was really difficult to get it back. We managed to get back the entire cable, but it was not easy. But as far as I know, until the very end, um, the cable was functional. So um, I, it was surprising, but a very pleasant surprise. Um, the, as far as the beam forming <clears throat> for the slow slip events, yes, or for any slip event, uh, yes, this can certainly be done. Um, what people are starting to see is that if you want to beam form stick slip or any kind of double couple source, you have to take into consideration the um, radiation pattern which actually changes the phase. It flips the phases uh, depending on where you make your observation. And this also paired with the different um, angles at which the, the seismic waves strike the cable, which also has to be accounted for, probably complicates beam forming a little bit, but I, 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 I still think it can be done. Great. That kind of leads into another question that some people are asking. Me. Do you have to worry about the geometry of the cable changing uh, for interpretation purposes during events like avalanches or even the slow moving glacier? Yeah. Um, so for the avalanche, I don't think it's a problem. Um, uh, I mean, this was a communication cable that uh, I don't expect it to move at all. Uh, for the glacier, yeah, yes, glacier motion is something. Um, I don't know. We're we're used to it. Usually, seismologists uh, they shake their heads when they hear that uh, the seismometer is moving. And uh, not just the sources are moving, but the seismometers are moving. Uh, but at the same time, also the cable I'm sure moved in some places by a few meters uh, when it was when it uh, dropped into a crevasse because uh, yeah, a snowball or, or an ice uh, ice um, piece pulled it into the crevasse. So I, I think this is something. Uh, you cannot expect to have high quality locations with this. It's more of the, you know, this, this philosophy of having so much data, so much coverage that will compensate for um, a loss in, in uh, precision. Great. Uh, another question from Tim here. I love seeing the multiple phase arrivals from a single basal ice quake by comparing direct slash reflected arrivals with your critically refracted arrivals. 
Can you learn anything about the basal interface, like sediments, water content, ice bed versus ice water contact? Um, yeah, so for this, uh, this was from the 2019 study where there was practically no uh, melt differences at, or at least pressure diff melt pressure differences at the base of the glacier. So we couldn't see any, we couldn't do any monitoring, if you will, but we could see that um, the base through which this um, refracted wave traveled uh, had a higher velocity, substantially higher velocity. I don't have the numbers in my head right now, but it was clearly granite or some really consolidated um, sediment and not a loose uh, water drain till. Great. Well, uh, I think Casey wanted to have some closing statements, but I, thanks a lot for doing this, Fabian. It was extremely informative for me and a lot of other people that are interested in DAS and the cryosphere. So thanks again. Sorry, we're not in person. So can't give you a round of applause, but I'm sure a lot of people can bug you about it later. <laughs> okay, great. Yes. Um, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Walter and Dr. Zoot. Um, the recording of this event will be made available as soon as possible on the Iris Earthquake Science webinar playlist. If you are interested in future DAS webinars, please join the DAS mailing list and check out the DAS RCN website. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on DAS in the cryosphere.